Hi everybody, this is Julian from AWS. Today we're going to keep exploring uh, Amazon SageMaker, our service for end-to-end uh, -end machine learning. Uh, maybe you've seen my previous video where I took you on a tour of uh, the different ways you could use SageMaker. And one of those ways is to use built-in algorithms, algorithms that have been implemented by the uh, Amazon and AWS teams uh, to basically make your life easier and all you have to do is provide your own data and fire up the training job and deploy the model and that's pretty much it. So today we're going to focus on one specific use case which is image classification. I'm going to show you how you can use the built-in algorithm uh, for image classification and we're going to do that in two different ways. Uh, we're going to uh, fine-tune an existing network uh, so fine-tuning is a very powerful technique uh, where you take a pre-trained network and you retrain it just for a little bit on your own data. And we'll see how that works. And we'll also try and train from scratch on, on the same data set and uh, we'll compare results. Okay, so what you're going to learn today is how to use your own data with the built-in algorithm for image classification. You're going to learn how to fine-tune a pre-trained network and you're going to learn how to train from scratch uh, using the built-in algorithm and your own data. Okay, and well, we'll cover some other SageMaker stuff, I guess. So let's get started. Uh, as you probably know, um, SageMaker comes with a bunch of uh, sample notebooks which are truly great uh, an excellent learning tool and one of them is based on that built-in algorithm for image classification okay and uh, basically what i've done is uh, i've taken this notebook and i've uh, modified it and, and reused it um, with a, a different data set and a few more additions, okay? But um, if you haven't seen this one before, then it's probably a good idea to, uh, to just run through that notebook uh, and then go back to uh, my own examples. So just a quick run through that one. Um, so this is using the Caltech 256 data set, which is an image data set for, uh, for classification with, as you can imagine, 256 classes. Okay, and um, well, the way you use it is, is uh, should be pretty familiar if you try uh, other built-in algos. So you pick um, the container um, that corresponds to your region, the container that uh, stores the uh, implementation for the image classification algo, and then you download the data set. Uh, you define some training parameters, and don't worry, we're gonna we're gonna go through all of these. You train, you defined uh, the training job, right? Uh, you launch the training job on manage infrastructure, and then uh, you save the train model in SageMaker. You create an endpoint configuration to serve prediction for based on that model. Then you create the endpoint itself, and then you can do inference. You can do prediction, and obviously. You can try it on images, and here, here's an image of a bathtub, and uh, well, here it is, definitely a bathtub. And uh, we invoke the endpoint for the Caltech, uh, uh, for the model train on uh, fine-tuned on Caltech 256, and we get with 88% probability uh, that it is a bathtub. Okay, so this is the this is the I would say the notebook that's uh, provided by SageMaker. So now let's um, see how difficult or not it is to uh, to take this example and use it with a different data set. Okay, so let's do this. Um, so what we do here, uh, what we're doing here is called transfer learning. So we're taking a pre-trained network um, a pre-trained MXNet network, as it turns out, and we're going to retrain it on a different data set, okay? Um, so which data set did I pick? Well, I took something that's pretty popular, it's called uh, uh, CIFAR-10, 
Um, it's got uh, 10 categories that you can see here on screen and uh, 50,000 images for training and 10,000 images for for the validation data set and they're all evenly uh, uh, spread across the 10 categories okay and the interesting fact is that these images are actually very small uh, 32 by 32 pixels so yeah you can guess it's pretty difficult you know with small images like this maybe for some images you know or maybe a horse looks like a deer or maybe a dog looks like a cat you know those are really really tiny images so it's a challenging data set to work with and it's it's very obviously uh, it's quite small and pretty easy to to download so it's a good example all right so let's see what we can do here oh, here it is okay so let's look at transfer learning first and then we'll look at training from scratch okay so what do we have to do here okay well uh, like I said um, we're going to use the built-in algorithm for image classification this is provided to you uh, it's it's part of the uh, SageMaker platform and what you have to do basically is use the docker container uh, hosted in the region where you're running the training job so here I'm running uh, that job in US East 1 so uh, obviously I'm going to pick that image okay but this uh, this Python code here is generic and uh, and you know it's gonna work for all those four regions okay so that's my first step say hey I want to point I'm, I'm running in that region I want to point to that docker container the, the the important thing also is to define my bucket where um, all the all the data set and uh, basically all everything for the training uh, uh, process is going to be hosted right it's going to be uh, it's going to be stored um, so there's no catch here uh, just make sure well just make sure <laughs> the bucket is in the same region as your uh, notebook instance okay so as you can see here again I'm using US East 1 and that bucket needs to be in the same region okay it's uh, it's a minor uh, a minor problem you could run into uh, and uh, your training job would fail because uh, SageMaker would not be able to uh, to grab the data set from the bucket okay just make sure it's in the same region but it's a normal S3 bucket no nothing weird okay then the second step is to uh, download the data set okay and put it in s3 right put it in that bucket I just mentioned so um, the, the image classification model can work with two different types of image data sets you could use um, a, a tree right uh, a directory tree of images um, that's supported and you need to provide uh, a list file uh, that uh, basically lists all the files included in the uh, in the directories um, and you will find uh, the details in the documentation for the uh, uh, the image classification model in the doc in the uh, SageMaker doc okay uh, so you could very well do that just have a um, um, you know directories uh, in an s3 bucket with you know one directory uh, per uh, per class and yes I'm aware we hate to say the word directory for s3 buckets so don't yell at me uh, but that's what people say anyway and that's what people understand so it makes more sense right um, so have that have those files um, correctly organized in an s3 bucket and you could directly train from from that the second way and I guess that's the preferred way at least it is my my preferred way is to use a record IO file uh, so a record IO file is a, it's an MXNet feature and you will find again uh, details on the MXNet website and the the benefits of this of, of using those files is basically you're going to pack you're going to group all the images in one single file so instead of having maybe tens of thousands of images which are you know difficult to move around and, and you never quite know if you copied everything maybe you missed one file maybe one file got corrupted and whatnot um, here you pack everything into a single file and these are those dot rec files that you see here and and that's where the data set lives okay uh, and the way you create those files is actually very simple um, there's a simple tool called uh, im 
to rec uh, in the uh, MXNet uh, distribution. And you just point that tool to your di image directory and it's going to create that rec file in just you know minutes or uh, you know maybe more it's a, if it's a very very large file so i would strongly encourage you to do this um, you have to do it only once uh, it's a good investment because you're going to do it once and possibly train many times so it just makes it easier to as you can see here to move the data sets around instead of having to you know shuffle and uh, you know thousands or tens of thousands of files okay so here i'm using those rec files um, and for that cipher 10 data set they're actually already built and available on the MXNet um, website. So you don't even have to do it. But if you were doing this with your own data set, just use that IM to rec uh, Python script to build those files. You know, you'll thank me. Uh, so I'm downloading those. I'm copying those to S3, to the S3 bucket. Uh, so my validation data set is uh, in the val under the validation slash Cypher 10 directory. And uh, my training set is under uh, train slash Cypher 10 uh, directory. As a side note, and it's a thing I've just recently found out about, um, make sure you have one single rec file in each of those, right? If, if you are like me, you, <laughs> you play around a lot, uh, you end up having multiple rec files in, in the same uh, in the same director here, and I, as it turns out, this confuses SageMaker, and and the training jobs fail. So um, that's why I added this, uh, you know, Cypher 10 level. Um, just make sure you don't mix the rec files for uh, for the different data sets. You know, it's going to confuse SageMaker. Okay, just a, a small tip. Okay, so now the data set is ready, uh, and the next step is to define the training parameters. Okay, and of course these are algorithm specific so here we're going to see parameters for image classification if we were using xjboost or something else these would be different okay again it's all explained in the documentation in the SageMaker documentation you have all the parameters that are common to all algos and and then the parameters that are specific to a, a given algo so here um, what should we uh, tell SageMaker. So the first thing is, how many layers do we want uh, to use for our uh, deep learning model? So uh, as it turns out, um, you can pick from a number of uh, from a, of a number of layer values, and uh, those are all uh, you know. We didn't invent those uh, those values. Obviously, they're uh, they're the ones that are um, uh, described in the research paper for uh, for that model, which I believe to be ResNet. Uh, because the, <laughs> the, layer, <laughs> the layer values here are typical uh, ResNet values. Anyway, it doesn't matter. So uh, what, keep in mind that um, you should use one set of values when you do transfer learning. You can pick from one set of values for transfer learning and another set of values for uh, when you train from scratch. These are just recommendations, okay? Uh, but here I'm using 50 layers for transfer learning because that's one of the recommended values. And as you will see for when I train from scratch, I'm using something else. Again, it's in the documentation. Take your time and read it, okay? Um, what about images? So as you know, um, the input layer for a convolutional neural network, which is what we use here, uh, needs to know uh, exactly what shape the uh, input data uh, will be. Okay, and the input data here are those images packed in the record I/O files. So they're color images. So they have three channels. Okay, and although the data set is uh, the original data set is uh, 32 by 32 pixels images have been resized to 2828 okay I, i'm not quite sure why um you know mnist images are 2828 so maybe it's just more convenient i don't know maybe whoever built the record io files um, figured out it would be a, a good idea to have the same sizes for mnist and, and cypher and I, I don't know but okay anyway that's the that's the image size if you are using your own images of course you know you would know what uh, what size your images are and you would have to define that here 
How many training samples do we have? Well, we have 50,000, like I said, uh, in 10 classes. Okay, so 5,000 samples per class. Uh, and then um, I'm going to use uh, 128 as my, as my batch size for training. And I'm going to um, train or fine tune for 10 epochs, okay, which is a pretty low number, but that's the, the whole purpose of fine tuning is that you will have a pre trained network, and in this case, it's been trained on ImageNet, right, which is a monster data set uh, with uh, uh, over, you know, over a million images, maybe more. Uh, and, uh, and we can benefit from that training, right? The network has already learned. Uh, basic geometrical features uh, and and the early layers in the network are uh, perfectly capable of detecting those features so what we want to do here is just train a little more right reuse that previous training but specialize it using our own images and 10 epochs should be enough to do that okay um, and then I'm picking a learning rate um, as you can see here it's a rather small value but again, I am fine tuning, so I don't want to train from scratch. I just want to, you know, tweak the weights, tweak that previous training just a little bit on those 50k images to make sure I got good accuracy, right? So that's why a smaller learning rate that we typically use um, is, is a good idea. Okay, I could pick an, a different optimizer here. By default, we're using SGD, but we could pick something else. It's just one of those parameters. And obviously, this one is super important. Um, this is the parameter that says, hey, uh, please use the existing weights, right? Do not uh, reinitialize the, the weights because I want to fine tune. Okay, so as you can see, these parameters are pretty easy i mean there's nothing really weird in here uh, how large the network should be wh uh, what's the size of the images in your data set how many uh, images are there are they um, how many classes and then a few uh, hyper parameters like batch size number of epochs learning rate and this is a very important parameter saying i want to fine tune i do not want to train from scratch okay all right so now uh, we have to talk to our friend uh, Jason, right? It is edible, yes, after all. So Jason is always there. Uh, and well, what do we do here? We define this training params uh, document, okay? And we're gonna find everything that we covered previously. So what tra what Docker image are we using? And that refers to the container name we saw before. What is the S3 bucket that we use to output everything? Uh, what kind of instance do we want to use to train? Here I will use a single P28XL um, uh, instance. Okay, I could use multiple instances. Distributed training um, uh, is supported. However, at this point, um, data sharing, the data set sharing across instances is not supported. So you have to fully replicate the data set to all instances, which is not a problem here because it's, you know, it's very tiny. If you had larger data sets, you know, slightly more inconvenient, but hopefully the SageMaker team will quickly uh, add this feature. Okay. Uh, a job name, the hyper parameters for the algo, okay, which are the ones we just talked about. Uh, what's the longest this job should run? Okay, and well, that's that's a lot. Is that a hundred hours? Yeah, it feels very long. And don't worry, it's not going to run that long. And then we need to define the input data configuration. So we have the training data set. Okay, what SageMaker calls the training channel. Uh, well, that lives in that slash train slash cipher ten. Uh, directory in my bucket, right? And uh, it's in a record IO format. And we have the validation channel, okay? Same thing, um, validation slash cipher 10 uh, directory in my bucket, again, record IO, okay? And that's it. So we defined, right? Uh, what algo do we want to use? How, what, what's the infrastructure we're going to uh, to use on SageMaker? What are the parameters for the training job? 
where's the training data, where's the validation data, right? Pretty pretty straightforward. And don't let JSON bother you. Come on, it's uh, you know, it's it's no big deal, right? Hopefully we can make this again a little simpler in the future, but it's just JSON and it's just setting parameters, okay? All right, now we get to the to the good stuff. Um, we can create the training job based on those parameters, and then you know it's going to run for a bit, and uh, and we can use these additional APIs to describe it, and we have this pretty uh, useful get waiter um, API that basically uh, you know is a blocking API, uh, and you know it's going to block until the training job is complete, obviously. Okay, so. And you can just run your notebook, and you know this is going to block, uh, and the, the 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 other cells are not going to run until the training is complete. So that's uh, that's pretty handy. Okay, so um, this one run for. Can we check that? I think it's. Uh, yeah, this one run for. Yeah, it's this one here. 17 minutes. Okay. Uh, and. Oh, where is it? Okay, here it is. And then, of course, it completed, right? Okay, and I've got this satisfying message saying, hey, it's done. So here's a section I did add to the original notebook um, because, okay, it's trained. I can see logs in CloudWatch, right? So uh, if you look, if we look at the training job here, right? And we go down a bit. Yeah, we can see uh, we can see logs uh, for for that uh, for that training job, and you can actually obviously look at them during training, right? So that's uh, that's a good way to monitor uh, your jobs and, and you know if they go wrong or if they don't learn successfully. Of course, you could kill them. Um, and well, it's a training job, right? So <laughs> it is an MXNet log. If you if you read some of my uh, MXNet stuff or if you use MXNet yourself. Well, you know, this is going to be very familiar. So we see the different epochs and we did pick uh, 10 epochs, right? Starting at zero, obviously. Um, and so the last one is going to be epoch nine. OK, and we can see here that checkpointing is enabled by default. Checkpointing is a useful technique where we're going to save parameters at the end of each epoch. OK, or every five epoch or five epochs. It's one of those uh, parameters you could set for the algo. Uh, here, by default, it's saving at the end of each epoch. And the purpose here is um, if you overfit after a while and you want, you don't want to use the latest, uh, uh, the last epoch as your model, you want to go back a few epochs because, you know, the, the, the accuracy was just better for those uh, earlier epochs, then you can go and grab the, the weight values um, from the checkpoints, so don't disable that. Uh, it's it's a uh, you know it's a great idea to have this by default and just leave it on. And as we can see, the after so each epoch took uh, something like 36 seconds, right? Um, so that was pretty fast fine tuning, right? And uh, well, we get to 77 percent or so accuracy but this is a cloudwatch log and you know it's uh it's fine you know more power to cloudwatch but uh, we'd like to have this uh in our notebook so how do we do that uh well we, we can use bodo 3 and connect to bodo 3 to cloudwatch logs and we can extract uh, the log for uh for this training job all um they're all stored in the training jobs uh group and each training job has a different name. Okay, so this is will never change. Well, I guess <laughs> unless the SageMaker team changes it. Uh, and uh, this is unique to your training job, so you can just grab that one from CloudWatch. Okay. Um, and then, basically, I'm just iterating over the log and uh, adding, um, uh, finding the lines that contain validation accuracy and extracting the, the value here and adding that to a, to a list. And I'm doing the same thing for the lines that contain train accuracy. So at the end, you know, train, I got all the training accuracies, I've got all the validation accuracies, and I can plot them, OK? And this is the result. So the maximum accuracy that I get is 77%. And I can see that my training job 
did work okay. Uh, training accuracy rose uh, pretty regularly and validation accuracy rose as well. Uh, obviously, this was very short, just 10 epochs, but okay, you know, I, I, you know, I got somewhere, 77%. Okay, so now um, I guess we can try that model, okay? So uh, the first step uh, after training would be to save the model, okay? So it says here create model, but what that really means is uh, uh, saving um, the trained model from, from the training job and uh, hosting it in SageMaker, okay? So maybe it should say host model, I don't know. Create model is, is a bit confusing to me, I think. Um, so, well, that's how you do it, okay? It's very standard SageMaker code. You will see this uh, pretty much in old examples, nothing, nothing weird here. And then, of course, what I want is to be able to do predictions. Okay, so uh, I'm going to create an endpoint configuration, um, and that endpoint configuration is basically this. It's um, using the model that I just saved, okay, uh, hosting it, deploying it on an M4X large instance, and there's only one. I could have many here. And all traffic will go to that to that uh, model. Okay. Um, maybe you know, maybe you don't, uh, but you can actually host multiple models behind the same endpoint. So in in an endpoint configuration, you could actually have multiple models, and you can split traffic across those models, and uh, to do A/B testing, and, and that's super convenient, of course. Uh, here, you know, no such thing. Here, we just have all traffic going to that model. So we just declare that configuration, we create the endpoint, okay, and this takes, uh, uh, oh no, sorry, that's just uh, creating the endpoint uh, configuration here, yep. And then we wait for the endpoint to be uh, to be ready. And, you know, it takes, takes a few minutes, okay, because we have to start the instance and we have to, uh, um, deploy the model, etc. Okay, and here too you can use that nice uh, get waiter uh, um, API just to you know to wait for the the endpoint to be in service. Okay, so once it is, then you're ready to do predictions. Okay, so at this point you have an HTTP endpoint uh, that can serve predictions uh, from. Uh, from your model, okay? So, of course, you know, we could use uh, curl and we could, uh, or we could use an SDK and do uh, HTTP uh, uh, gets, etc. cetera. Um, but we could also use um, the SageMaker SDK to do this. So that's a bit easier because I can stay in the notebook, okay? All right, so uh, we're grabbing a client uh, for the uh, SageMaker runtime. Here I've got a few images. Uh, that I downloaded, uh, that I can download from the web. So these are there. I've got a bird, I've got a horse, I've got a dog, and I've got a truck. Okay, and these are uh, really random images um, that are not in the data set. Okay, so let's let's call them real life images. Okay, so pretty nice truck. Okay, so how does that uh, work with our model? Well, we're going to read uh, the bytes. For the image file, and we're going to invoke our endpoint, saying, "Hey, here's an image. You figure it out." Okay. And uh, as you can see, I don't have to resize the image. I can pass. Um, I can pass any image. It's going to be resized um, by uh, um, by the API, right? So that's cool. And and then I'm so I'm invoking the endpoint. I'm getting a response. Okay. And that in that response, I have my prediction results, which are uh, the, as you can see here, the 10 probabilities uh, corresponding to the 10 Cypher 10 classes, which are again, airplane, automobile, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so I just have to take um, the max of the max probability, find what its uh, index is, and I know what category this image uh, belongs to. And here, well, it is a truck, with 77% probability, so that's a pretty good score, right? So we're quite sure, quite sure it's a truck. Uh, not sure what the second highest would be, 
Um, is that this one? Airplane? Yeah, surprisingly, you know, it doesn't see this as, as an automobile at all. Uh, well, the second choice would be, if it's not a truck, then it's an airplane. All right, so it is a truck. <laughs> oh, no, we have, a, yeah, yeah, that's the one. That's the truck, last category. So truck is the highest, airplane is the second highest, and then, well, it's probably, uh, it's probably the car. All right. Okay, so that's good. Let's try other ones. Let's try the bird. Okay, so let's just download this bird, right? And yes, I know what kind of bird it is, but I know the French name and not the English name, so sorry about that. In French, we say rouge gorge, right? So uh, if you know what, what's the English name, I'm just curious, right? Or I guess I could look it up, but hey, I'm lazy. So yeah, it is a bird, 36%, uh, 30, so it's... You know, it's a bit lower but you know again uh, there's a lot of uh, white space here so imagine reciting this to 32 32 right um, there would be a lot of empty space so the actual bird is just going to be a few pixels so it, it's doing a good job and what would be the second choice so the second choice would be this actually the second choice would be oh no is it this one so this is okay this is the bird cat deer, uh, dog, frog, horse. Okay, well, it's not a horse. Guess what? It is a bird. So, as you can see, you know, it's it's a lower score, but, you know, it's still we still get it right. Okay, and again, resize this to 32, 32, and look for yourself. It's going to be challenging to figure out what this is. So, let's try a horse now. Okay, so it's really a horse head. Right, it's not the full uh, the full animal. So can we still figure it out? Oh uh, yeah, really good score, uh, almost 97%. Okay, so there's really really no doubt that this is a this is a horse. Okay, so very good job on this one. And let's try the dog. Okay, well it's a nice one. Nice center picture should be easy. Okay, ninety-four percent. So here it's uh, again, uh, it's a very high score, right? So, so as you can see, uh, before we move on to training from scratch, um, let's recap quickly what we did here. Okay, so first of all, we took the vanilla uh, notebook for image classification. Uh, which is provided to you uh, in, in SageMaker. And we just basically changed the data set, right? I downloaded Cypher 10 instead of Caltech 256. So two lines of code here, or four lines of code actually. I just changed some parameters here, right? Image shape is probably data set specific. Number of training samples and classes are probably uh, data set specific. The rest, you know, you could leave it as is. Um, so just adapt this for your, your data set. And this is it. Everything else is um, unchanged. I don't think I modified anything in here for a Cypher 10. Uh, well, I did add this, obviously, uh, this plotting thing. But again, this is just uh, very generic too. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with uh, with the data set. So, as it turns out, um, you know, if you want to do uh, image classification, um, you could very well just grab this notebook, uh, change the data set, and, uh, and that's it. So, there's hardly any code to write. It's more configuration, right? So, um, you know, of course, you could use Amazon recognition if, uh, if your labels and, uh, uh, and everything else uh, worked for you, but um, you know I meet some customers who have custom labels or custom images that don't work very well with recognition, and this would be the next best thing. It just would be, hey, let's throw our labeled data set into S3 and um, and use this notebook for 
transfer learning, experiment with different layer sizes, etc., and you could get very good results, right? Um, and again, uh, if you think that uh, this 77% uh, accuracy is, is a bit low, well, I guess you're right. It is a bit low, but again, Cypher 10 is a very challenging data set to learn because, again, the images are so small. So if you add larger images and, and you, if you fine tune maybe for a little longer than 10 epochs, uh, you could get to extremely high scores, right? So uh, let's move on to, let's compare this to training from scratch, right? So here we fine tuned the model. Uh, let's quickly see the difference uh, when, uh, if I wanted to train from scratch, okay? So same data set, um, same algorithm, right? All that stuff is identical, okay? Basically, the only things that I changed here are, well, obviously, this, right? I am not using the pre-trained model, so uh, I, I, I am just using the model definition, the model layout, but I, I want to throw away all those pre-trained weights. So here, SageMaker is going to reinitialize randomly all those weights, and I'm going to try, I'm going to train from scratch, okay? So this is how you say, hey, I want to do scratch training or I want to do uh, transfer learning, okay? I'm using a different number of layers. Like I said, um, um, the recommendation is to pick from one set of layer values for uh, fine tuning and another set uh, from uh, for uh, learning. Okay, learning from scratch. So it's in the dark here. I took a, you know cl the closest value to 50, which is the one I used previously. So 44 is what I use here. Shape is identical number of training samples identical, classes identical, batch size identical, but of course now I'm training from scratch, so I need to train for much longer. So I figured out, hey, you know, why not 100 epochs? Let's see, uh, let's see uh, if that's enough. And I could use a different optimizer um, if I wanted to, instead of SGD, as it turns out, it, you know, it doesn't seem to make a whole, whole lot of difference here. Okay, but hey, I just wanted to show you, you could use something else than SGD. Uh, training is strictly identical, okay? Uh, all this stuff is identical, okay? Here's my plotting uh, uh, weird stuff, you know, and yeah, some of you are going to complain, oh, this is ugly code and it's not Pythonic. Yeah, it might not be Pythonic, but hey, I can read it. So, and so can you, I hope so. You know, I try to write code that people can read. And yeah, if it's not Pythonic, oh well, okay. Um, so same code, and here are the results. So the, after 100 epochs, the maximum validation accuracy that I get to is 77.4. So it's you know just a tiny bit higher. And uh, well, the curves looks okay, right? Uh, training accuracy is getting to one, almost one. And validation accuracy is, you know, it's, well, it's it's down there, but it, it is increasing, right? Um, and, well, it's it's a similar number, okay? So it's, it's interesting to see that it does take me 10 times longer to get to pretty much the same accuracy when I learn from scratch. So does this mean that this network performs just as well as the other one? Well, that's that's a big question mark, okay? Because validation accuracy is just it's it's just one measure of uh, how uh, how the how the model does on the the validation data set, those ten thousand images. But what about real life pictures, okay? Let's try those. So once again, I'm hosting the model, I'm deploying it beyond an endpoint, exact same code as before, okay? Uh, I can see my logs in CloudWatch as well. I didn't show you the logs, but hey, here it is. Okay, so yeah, we get to, uh, at the last epoch, as you can see, we get to almost, you know, well, almost 100%. So we're pretty close to learning that thing perfectly. And uh, well, I guess we're dangerously close to starting to overfit, maybe. Uh, and uh, well, here's my 
last accuracy is 76.93. So actually, you know, I could have picked, uh, you know, maybe I am overfitting already. Uh, yeah, I don't know. It's hard to say because this uh, 77.4, yeah, here it was. That 77.4 accuracy was here, uh, Epoch uh, 97. So I don't know. Uh, you know, your guess is as good as mine. Uh, I would say I am not overfitting because I think my curve is probably still increasing. So I could have pushed it maybe a little bit, but okay, 100 epochs should be good enough. Okay. So let's go and predict again. So let's let's do them in the same order. Okay. So let's do the truck. All right. And here we go. Oh, wow, that's a super, super high score. Okay, so the truck is, well, yeah, almost 100%. Oh, well, that's nice. Okay, so uh, it's actually, uh, I think it's a higher score than uh, one we got for uh, uh, for uh, transfer learning, right? But keep in mind, we had to train for 10 times longer. Okay, so one point <laughs> for training from scratch. Let's try the bird. Okay, here we go. Oh, wow. Again, excellent score. Excellent score. Okay, so... Hmm. Does, uh, does training from scratch have the, uh, have the uh, edge here? Well, I think we got 36 or 37%, right? For, um, for that initial... Uh, uh, for that uh, transfer learning example. So, yeah, bird, bird is great. Let's see what the horse is all about. Oh, oh, that hurts. Okay. Oh, so it gets it completely wrong. Okay. So, well, no, I don't think this is a dog, right? All right. Just let me check. I did. Oh, uh, yeah. It is the horse picture, right? Because you would think, hey, maybe I got it wrong and. I actually pasted the, the dog image in there, but no. Oh man. Okay, that's awful. Okay, so this is this is a complete miss. Okay, and uh, the horse score is actually very very low. It's that one here, right? So it's hmm, not even half a percent. So that's a huge miss, right? Okay, so two two excellent scores and one awful one. Uh, let's try the dog. Ouch. Okay. Mm. All right. No, that's not a frog either. And uh, the dog score. So here's the. Oh, actually, yeah. Mm. Okay. It's okay. It's it's a it's a half empty kind of thing, right? Um, you know. So it got the dog. It got pretty close to designing it was a dog, but mm -hmm, no, maybe it's a frog. So uh, it, it is still a bad miss, right? Uh, it's still a bad miss because this should be an easy picture to guess. And, um, and uh, you know, with fine tuning, we did better, much better. So, well, as you can, it's actually very interesting here because out of those four examples, um, two are perfect, right? Better than with uh, uh, transfer learning. One is completely wrong, is completely awful, right? The, uh, the horse. And, uh, and the dog is like, yeah, you know, mm. Not really, okay. So obviously you cannot uh, you cannot make any uh, you know any general uh, comment on uh, oh fine tuning is awesome and learning from scratch sucks. These are just four test images, um, and of course we would need to run you know a few thousand uh, images from a, from a test set, right? And and decide. Uh, you know, get get some metrics and see uh, how well each uh, each model does, and uh, and of course, depending on your business case, you know, um, it, you know, it could you could come to very different conclusions. I mean, um, you, maybe it's a huge business problem for you to get the horse wrong. I mean, you know, maybe that's just you know, it's it's awful, right? It's it has very bad consequences for for customers. Um, 
you know, if not, you could say, yeah, okay, I can live, you know, I can live with uh, errors on horses, uh, maybe validation, maybe my test set for horses is, it gets a really bad score. But, you know, mostly I care about trucks and, uh, and birds, right? Now, I don't know what kind of company would be interested in that, but hey, that's just an example. So um, it, it's all very subjective. Um, one thing that isn't, though, is, um, you know, training times. And uh, as you saw, it took us uh, 10 times uh, longer to train from scratch and get to those results, right, uh, versus fine tuning, okay? Um, and another thing is obviously if you don't have a lot of images, uh, well, it's probably a much better idea to fine tune than to, tr than to train from scratch. And uh, maybe that's the problem that we see here. You know, maybe uh, 5,000 dogs uh, is not enough uh, to actually train from scratch. Okay, it's quite likely that's the, the problem we have here. Um, you know, maybe 5,000 trucks is enough, but maybe dogs are, there are many kinds of dogs, you know, many colors, many shapes, um, etc. And maybe we just need more dog pictures to get a good result, okay? Uh, and maybe that's the same for, uh, maybe that's the same for horses, okay? Horses are, I don't know, maybe just, you know, brainstorming here. Um, and, well, when you do fine tuning, um, you, you reuse um, the, obviously the previous training from um, the original data set and ImageNet, like I said, it's a very rich data set. So it's got all kinds of pictures and it's quite likely that um, if you fine tune this, uh, you're, you're going to end up generalizing better to, uh, to new images. And that's why a lot of people love fine tuning because it's, it's faster, it's computationally much less intensive and thus much less expensive uh, than uh, training from scratch. It's easier to do. Training from scratch is, you know, can get, can get tricky. Uh, you know, you have to get all the hyperparameters right. Uh, and, and, you know, it's there's a lot of trial and error here. Uh, versus, you know, fine tuning, you start from something that has been optimized by experts. You throw uh, your images at this. And you know it can only improve, right? It's it's only gonna it's only gonna improve uh, versus training from scratch, where uh, you, know, you could get it totally wrong and get very weird results, and it might be very difficult to understand why, like like this case here, right? Okay, sorry, buddy, you're not a frog. Okay, all right, well that's um, that's. It, I think. Um, oh, I just wanted to point out this is kind of a <laughs> kind of a reboot uh, of an article that I wrote um, a month ago uh, on MXNet. So um, it, you know, I'm not going to go through this. Uh, I've talked long enough. But if you're interested in uh, seeing how you would do this with uh, vanilla MXNet, right, without using SageMaker. Uh, you can go and uh, and read uh, this article on my uh, on my blog. I will include all the link, all the links and the links to the notebooks as well, in the video description. So yeah, if you want to see, you know, how how I did it using uh, using just MXNet code and doing everything by hand, right? Uh, well, you you can you can check this one out. It's interesting to compare this uh, to um, to actually doing it with SageMaker, right? So I think it shows how cool SageMaker is and how simpler uh, your uh, your training uh, jobs be be become with this, right? All right, well, that's it for today. Again, uh, links in uh, the video description. Thank you very much for listening. If you have questions, feel free to ask them in, uh, in the comment section of the video. I do read that. Or uh, you can uh, find me on Twitter as well. And, uh, you know, happy to answer questions and uh, help you out. Well, I hope you liked this. I think it was fun. I had fun recording it. And uh, thanks again. And talk to you later. Bye-bye.